So how are you guys doing? Well, awesome. Well, today we're kicking off a short three-week sermon series called Trending, where we're looking at some of the tough Christian, uh, tough issues that we struggle with as Christians, and even some questions that can keep people from following Jesus. And, and I think one of the mistakes we make with, with these kinds of questions is we either don't get answers, we just kind of sit with our struggle and our doubts, or we ask friends who don't know any more than we do, or we go to Google who is not a godly source and we type stuff into Google, but we want to look at what God has to say about some of these difficult topics. And today we're not dipping our toe into the shallow end of the pool, we're diving right into the deep end and asking this big question, why does God allow suffering? I think that is one of the bigger questions that we struggle with as Christians. If you've ever been hit with that question by someone else and you weren't ready for it, it can get awkward really fast. And that may be something you're struggling with right now. I know it's a question I've struggled with at different points in my life. The first time was when I was eight years old. My dad was a great preacher. He was a great husband and father, but more than that, He was my hero, and and in 1977, he was killed in a plane crash, and I remember that day like it was yesterday, and I can still remember details. I remember that the person that drove up and told us was a deacon in our church who owned the local funeral home, and I remember that my mom had baked my dad's favorite pie for dinner that night, and I just remember over and over as she cried, she just kept saying, I baked this pie for him. I I can remember how I suffered for months, and I cried almost every day. Over the last 45 years, that pain has lessened, and it's it's gotten better over time, but it hasn't completely gone away. I'll see something that will remind me of my dad, and I'll get sad again. About four years ago, I found his doctoral thesis for his doctorate in ministry, and this was a 120-page, hardbound book, probably took him over a year to research and write. And as I was flipping through it for the first time since I was little, I realized that he had dedicated that to me. It said, to my son Nathan, with the prayer that you will find God's best for your life. And I cried when I read that the first time. I cried when I wrote this sermon. I'm struggling a little bit right now. 45 years later, it's still tough. It brought heartache and pain, but it also helped shape me into who I am. And a lot of you guys have experienced similar tragedies. And if you haven't already, you probably will. You know, there's pain and suffering all around us. Man, if you were here for the last five or six years, you remember Hurricane Harvey. It was a big deal. It destroyed or damaged thousands of homes. I I remember our neighborhood was flooded and we had to rush out. We were out of our house for nine days. We only found out that our house didn't flood when we canoed into our neighborhood about five days later because there was still about four feet of water in the street. Our house didn't flood, but a lot of you were not that lucky. And if you keep up with the news, you've seen there's already been tornadoes in other parts of the country that have just created swaths of death and destruction in towns. Uh, If you're not aware, you've lived under a rock for the last year, you may not know that Russia invaded Ukraine and hundreds of thousands of people have died. Many more than that injured. I read that 15 million Ukrainians are have been forced to leave their homes and their towns. There was an earthquake in February. Do you guys remember that? In Syria and Turkey, 50,000 people died in just one moment. Pain and suffering and hurt is all around us, and it makes us ask the question, why? Why does God allow those things to happen? Why does he allow someone to go into a store or a church or a school and shoot and kill people? Why does he allow those things? If God can prevent tragedies, why do they happen? Well, let's try to tackle this difficult question. But before we do that, I actually want to stop for just a minute. I want to pray real quick for wisdom as we tackle this difficult question. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that you just open our eyes and our hearts to your message and to the truth of who you are and what you've done. God, just give us wisdom, give me the words that you would have me say, and give people the hearts to hear and to understand. I ask all this in your son's name, amen. All right, so here is the classic statement that are thrown up by non-believers, this logical fallacy. Here's what it says, either God is all-powerful, but he's not all-good, therefore he doesn't stop suffering, or he's all good, but he's not all powerful, therefore he's incapable 
of stopping suffering. Have you ever thought about something similar to that? And really, this logical fallacy brings up three different questions. Here's the first one. Is God all-powerful? Got to answer that question. The second question it brings up is, is God good? And and then if God is all-powerful and God is good, then it brings up a third question. Why does God allow suffering? And we're going to try to hit all of those questions today, but understand this is a big topic and we could spend a whole six-week series just trying to work through this issue. All right. Let's start with what God says about himself and how we can relate to this issue. Look at Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here's a mistake we make. We sometimes think that God looks at things the way we do. He thinks about things the way we do. He acts the way we do. He doesn't. He is dramatically different than we are. And so to get a grapple with this tough question, we got to start with this premise that God doesn't think about things the way we do. We know just enough about God to be dangerous. We're made in God's image, and so we can relate to God's thoughts, but we can't come close to fully understanding those thoughts. All right, so with that understanding, let's tackle this first question. Is God all-powerful? And that's actually the easiest question to answer. That one I don't struggle with much at all. If you look at Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you can believe that God created the heavens and the earth, and then you understand the size and majesty and magnitude of God's creation, you will understand that God is, in fact, all-powerful. When we think about the universe created by God, it's mind-boggling. Even the earth is really big. Let me just tell you how big the earth is. If you were to travel around the earth at the equator, it's 24,901 miles. It would take a Boeing 747 45 hours of in-flight time to go around the globe at the equator. Earth's a pretty big place, but it's tiny compared to other objects in the known universe. The sun is about one million times bigger than the earth. Let me help you get an understanding of that size difference with this comparison. If you were to shrink the earth down to the size of a golf ball, and you shrank the sun down to the same comparative size, it would be bigger than this stage, just to get a perspective on that. But the sun is actually a pretty small object. It's a pretty small star in the sky. There's another star called Betelgeuse, and again, if the earth was shrunk down to the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse, if shrunk down comparatively, would be the size of six Empire State Buildings stacked on top of one another compared to this earth ball. Think about that. That's the equivalent of covering, uh, of filling a football stadium, a big pro football stadium with golf balls 3,000 times. That's the size difference. Canis Majoris was thought for a long time to be the biggest star in the sky, and so they named it the Big Dog. And and if we look at the comparison between the Big Dog and the Earth, it's pretty amazing. Again, if the Earth is shrunk down to the size of a golf ball, the Big Dog, or Canis Majoris, would be the size of Mount Everest, which is six miles high. That's your comparison. You can fit seven quadrillion Earths into the Big Dog, seven quadrillion. Think about that. That's the same of covering the entire state of Texas with golf balls 22 inches deep. Think about it this way. Just to get an understanding of seven quadrillion, even what that is, if you were to count from one to a quadrillion with a one every second, so 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, it would take you 32 million years to do that. Then multiply that times seven to understand how much bigger that Canis Majoris is than the earth. And in the last few years, Canis Majoris has gone from being the big dog to kind of just a cocker spaniel, because we now know that there are at least seven stars that are significantly bigger than Canis Majoris. Just imagine what they're going to discover in the next five years. Now, that's a little perspective on the size of individual objects like stars, but let me tell you how many stars that we know about. Scientists believe that there are a billion trillion stars in the known universe. Here's what that number looks like. 
That's a one with 21 zeros after it. And if that's not impressive enough for you, that's just the known universe. We can't even know what's out beyond what we can estimate is there. God's creation is probably even bigger than that. We can't even grapple with what God has done. And so when we look up at the night sky, that will make us feel very small and very insignificant. And that's actually important to understand this question, to understand how different God is so that we can understand this question of why does God allow suffering. But what we know is God is all-powerful. He did that. So he can control what happens. Here's the second question. Is God good? That's a tough question that we're going to have to grapple with. Let's start with what Jesus has to say about this. Jesus, there's a story about Jesus where this rich man comes up to him and asks how to inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's often called the rich young ruler. You may have heard it that way. But let's look at that story together. This is Mark 10, 17 through 22. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And listen to Jesus' response. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I've done since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So this man comes up and he says, what do I have to do to get to heaven? And Jesus says, you follow the rules. And this guy says, I follow all the rules. I do a really good job of that. And there's nothing to indicate that he didn't. He was probably a very good man in the way he tried to live. But I want to focus on the beginning of this story. When he first comes up and he calls Jesus good teacher, look at Jesus' odd response. He says, no one is good except God alone. That's odd for Jesus, given that Jesus was perfect. Was Jesus saying that he's not good? No, of course not. That's not what he was saying. He was telling this man an important issue that he's also telling us, which is, what is good? You're not good just because you follow the rules. Only God is good. And, and that's so important for him to understand. He thought he followed the rules. He thought he knew the rules pretty well. So he knew what good was. And Jesus is reminding him that only God is good. And that's a reminder for us as well, because I think we tend to think that we know what good is. So it brings up this incredibly important question, if we're going to decide, is God good, is what is good? And who gets to decide what good is? And you may be thinking, well, well preacher... I do. God may have made a, a billion trillion stars and he may have been around for all eternity. But you know, I've been to a few Bible studies and I listen to KSBJ on a regular basis. I've got a pretty good sense of that. But Jesus would say the same thing to you that he said to this rich young ruler. No one is good except God alone. We tend to make ourselves the center of the moral universe and we get to decide what's good and what's not good. But we are not the arbiters of goodness. To think that we are is incredible arrogance and hubris. The goodness of God is not defined by what I think. It's not defined by what you think. It's not defined by what your Uncle Ernie at Thanksgiving thinks. It's defined by God. Whatever God says good is, is good. Whatever God does is good. See, the problem with our definition of good is it's limited by our limited experience. Let me, let me give you some examples. Some of you guys think Brussels sprouts are good. You're wrong. Objectively, you're wrong. Here's the proper way to serve Brussels sprouts. Open the trash can and scrape. <laughs> There's also the issue, I, like I think ice cream is just okay. Some of you guys would take issue with that because you think ice cream is really, really good. It's subjective. Now those are funny examples, but let me give you a serious example. How many different denominations of churches are there? We're all trying to figure out and we disagree about what good is. The Methodist denomination right now is splitting over the issue of how to respond to the issue of homosexuality in our communities and in our churches. And I assure you, both sides of that issue think they are doing what is good. 
but they can't both be right. Good is not what we think it is. Good is what God says it is. Our thoughts about what is good is subjective. And candidly, it's just based on our limited understanding of the Judeo-Christian ethic. I didn't think I'd ever get to say that in a sermon, but I am. The Judeo-Christian ethic that we've learned from 2,000 years of Christianity has affected our society so that we think about those things. Right? Our justice system is based on that. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal is based on that Judeo-Christian ethic. And, and so you have an understanding of good even if you don't go to church because you kind of have this perception of, of good from what the Bible says that it has built our culture. But let me assure you that your Bible studies, your reading the Bible, does not give you the understanding of what is good nearly to the extent that God has. God defines goodness. And as churches, what we have to do is just do our very best to read and understand what God says is good and then to try to live that out. But look at me. When your opinion on goodness differs from God, you're wrong. It's that simple. So if God is good, because he made the universe, it's his rules, he defines what that is, and he's all-powerful, then that brings up the final question. Why does a good God that's all-powerful allow suffering and evil in the world? And there's actually a number of reasons for this, and we're going to look at a few of those. The first is this. He gave us a choice of good or evil. God created us to choose to have a relationship with us, with him, to choose to love him. But the freedom to choose to love him and have a relationship with him also means that we have the freedom to choose not to love him, not to have a relationship with him. He wants us to choose good as he tells us, but so often we go the other way and choose evil. Now, why is that? God could have made us like robots where we had no choice. We just walked around going, I love God. I, but that's not what he did. He created us because he wanted a real relationship with us. And so he gave us the freedom to choose. That's how freedom works. Think about this. If my wife only loved me because she was forced to, is that really even love? She chose to marry me. I, I have no idea why. I don't understand it. I can only assume it's my real, kind of how I look like Chris Helmsworth, but I'm not sure. God wants us to choose to love him. But he gave us a choice so that we can choose not to. And, and remember, God didn't choose evil. We did. If you go all the way back to the very beginning of Adam and Eve, they were put in this perfect garden, and they had one rule. Don't eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Their job in this perfect garden was basically hang out, enjoy the garden, and name all the animals. They had one rule, and they messed it up. Now, I want to clear up some Bible confusion. I'm going to get a little off topic here for a second. The, the knowledge of fruit and evil fruit is not an apple. The Bible doesn't say it's an apple, but more importantly than that, I ain't getting kicked out of the garden over an apple. It's just not that good. Maybe some of those little cuties or some fresh pineapple, but not apples. Apples just aren't good. There's that subjective good again, but I've gotten off topic. They had one rule, and they messed it up. They chose evil over good. And when they did that, they messed it up for all of us, and they brought evil and suffering and death into the world. But here's the reality. If they hadn't messed it up, I would have, and so would you. And then because we choose evil, it brings all the consequences of evil into the world. When someone chooses to go into a church and begin shooting people, that's evil. That's an evil person. And the result of that evil is hurt and suffering. Evil is never God's desire. Evil is our choice. And then because we live in a world that's filled with evil, we live in a world that's also filled with suffering and death and disease. And if you've noticed as our nation continues to turn away from God, do you see more and more shootings happen, what seems like now on an almost weekly basis? Our world is deteriorating with hate and violence. Our world is broken by sin, and because of that, there is suffering, and there will be until Jesus returns. All right, here's another reason why God allows suffering. He sees things from an eternal perspective. Have you ever tried to think about what eternity looks like? Really have it? I have, and it makes my head hurt. Whenever I think, think about living a thousand years. 
Think about living a million years, and, and then a hundred million years, and a million million years, and you're just getting started. To understand a little bit about God, you have to understand that He has already existed for an eternity before you were born. And, and so He sees things different than you do. Our perception of the world is based on somewhere between probably 16 years and 90 years of our little vision of our little piece of the world. But God is seeing all of eternity. And not only has he seen all the eternity in the past, he sees all of the eternity in the future. And he's already preparing for the end when Jesus returns. So because our perspective is, is very limited, things seem like a bigger deal to us than God. So if you've been struggling with an illness or an injury for, let's say, 10 years, and you're 40 years old, that's about a fourth of your existence. And that's why you see it as a big deal. God knows that you're going to exist for an eternity. So it's not nearly as big a deal to him because he sees all of that vastness stretching out into the future. He thinks about it differently than we do. The Bible says it this way in 2 Peter 3.8. He says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. This eternal perspective allows God to see things differently than we do, and he sees our suffering differently than we do. A few years ago, I was pastoring at a different church, and one day during the week, one of the receptionists came in and said, uh, Nathan, there's a couple of ladies here in the lobby that are very upset, would like to visit with a pastor. So I went out to the lobby, and I could see immediately that they were very sad, and I began to talk to them, and they were sisters. They were probably in their mid to late 20s, and they told me that their brother had just been diagnosed with a very rare and, and serious form of cancer. And they were very upset with God. They didn't understand why God would allow this to happen. But in our discussion, they also told me that they hadn't been in church since they were little kids. And suddenly, I saw something that perhaps they didn't see. And so I had the opportunity to share about Jesus with them, share about why God would allow suffering, and to pray with them and pray for their brother. And what they saw in that moment was suffering in a moment. What God saw was a moment that would help prepare them for eternity. Gave them an opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus. See, I, I don't think God gave their brother cancer. Because I think that's a result of sin that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. And that we live in a broken and, and world that's filled with sickness and death. But I do believe that God allowed that suffering to have an eternal impact on them. To give them an opportunity for their eternity to be changed. Think about what happens when there's a major disaster, whether that's a hurricane or a tornado or some pandemic. Who are usually the first people that show up? Churches and mission organizations. Think about Hurricane Harvey. Churches played a huge role in both temporary relief for people that suffered from Hurricane Harvey, but also rebuilding houses, restoring houses. Lots of people started going to the church that helped them out during Hurricane Harvey. We have people in this church that we helped out when they were struggling and going through hardship. God uses hardship to allow his church to shine like a bright light in a dark world. And so that's why it's so important that we are active as a church in serving our community. That's why we want to be a church, and we are a church that involves ourselves in missions, supporting the least of these, like young single moms and homeless individuals. Because we're not just helping their circumstances, we're giving them an opportunity to meet Jesus, who changes their eternity. If you look back at Jesus' ministry here on earth, when he healed somebody, he was less fixing their physical problem and more showing them the power and the glory of God so that they'd have an opportunity to follow Jesus into eternity. Jesus was a whole lot less about fixing people's short-term situations, and he was way more about fixing their permanent change in eternity. God sees things from an eternal perspective, and that makes him look at things a little different than what we do. Remember what God says about himself in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So I want to see if I can give you a visual illustration of this. I want you to take a look at this picture and tell me if you can identify it. You know what that is? Let's zoom out a little and see if we can get a little different perspective, a little bigger perspective. Anybody recognize it now? All right, let's zoom out a little more and see what we can see. Anybody recognize it now? You guys know what that is. 
starring that, right? But you didn't recognize it at first. And I think that little visual illustration helps us understand. We're so focused on this moment in eternity, our little 90 years, and this little part of our world that we don't see the big picture. God is focused on all of eternity and all of creation, and so he sees things through a different lens. All right, here's another reason that our good God allows suffering. He uses suffering to grow us in faith. The Bible talks a lot about this idea. In the Old Testament, it says this. In the book of Isaiah 48, 10, it says, See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. And then James, the half-brother of Jesus, he wrote a letter to the churches, the the Jewish churches uh, in the New Testament. And what he wrote is, is how, this is how he began the letter in James 1, 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. So he says, hello. And then he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. What a horrible way to start a letter. He starts out by saying, consider it pure joy when you suffer. And at first glance, that didn't even seem right to us. But we do grow through hardship. Think about this like exercise. If if you're weight training, I've read about this. I don't really know firsthand. But if you weight train, when you lift weights, what are you doing to your muscles? You're tearing them down. And then your body responds to that, and it not only builds back the muscle that you lost, but it builds a stronger muscle complex going forward. But if you're going to get stronger, you got to have a little pain and suffering to get to that place. And that's how hardship and difficulty work in our faith. When we go through tough things, we realize our faith is stronger than we thought it is. When we go through tough things, we realize that we can handle more with God's help than we even thought we could. When we go through suffering and we still love and praise God, our relationship with him grows. We're growing through our suffering. Now, James says, consider it pure joy when you suffer. I'm going to admit it, I'm not there yet. But we will suffer in this life, and so we need to be prepared for it. You know, that suffering may come from some unexpected health challenge or a financial burden. It it can come from persecution, from sharing your faith and somebody dislikes you or makes fun of you. We ought to consider it joy when we are holy and we follow after Jesus and there are consequences with our family, with our friends, or even in our jobs. We grow stronger through the storms. Here's a difficult truth that we have to understand about God. God is less concerned with our happiness and more concerned with our holiness. He's less interested in growing your finances and more interested in growing your faith. He's less interested in you working out to look like Chris Hemsworth or Taylor Swift and you working to look more like him. And when we look more like him, we endure difficulty with suffering and grace because that's what he did. Here's the last reason that I came up with that that I could find in the Bible that uh, God allows suffering. He uses suffering to get our attention. We're so focused on chasing after the things of this world. Our focus is supposed to be on eternity, on things eternal. Listen to how Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's where our focus is supposed to be. But we we get lost in the daily routine. We, We start to really focus on career, and we focus on kids' soccer games, and we focus on other things like cars, And we begin to go to sleep on what's most important. We're lulled into this slumber by Satan. And so we lose our eternal focus. All right, let me ask you a couple of questions. I want you to raise your hand. How many of you still use kind of an old-fashioned alarm clock, something other than your cell phone? Anybody? Okay, not anybody I can see. Who all uses cell phones for an alarm in the morning? Everybody. Who sets a snooze and uses a snooze almost every day? All right, how many of you guys have to have backup alarms? Yeah, yeah, so several of you guys. What's cool about cell phones is you can sell, set it for any wake-up tone or you can set a song, but you got to be careful. If you set it for too peaceful a song, 
Man, you're just going to incorporate that into your dream and just keep on sleeping. Like this sound would not work for me. Oh, that's beautiful. I think I'm in like a spa somewhere and just continue to sleep. If I'm going to wake up, this is more of what I need. That'll wake you up. In fact, it just woke a couple of people up during my sermon. I'm going to do that about 23 minutes in every week, just play those same noises. <laughs> but I'm not as bad as some people. I've heard about alarm clocks where you have to enter a code to get it to go off. Have y'all heard about that? So you got to be awake enough to remember the code, you know, the seven-digit code you have to put in. My favorite is an alarm clock that's built like a ball. You set it, and then you put it down on the floor. And when you reach out to turn it off, it's got a motion sensor, so it runs away from you. So you've got to get out of bed, and you've got to chase that alarm clock around. Now, I wouldn't want that one because once I caught it, <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, it's not going to make it another night. You set it, and it wakes you up. See, suffering can be an alarm clock to what's most important. I have personal experience with that. I, I was called to preach when I was a teenager, and I did something very similar. Instead, I went to law school for a very similar uh, uh, background in education. And then when my family uh, began having kids, I didn't take them to church much because I didn't want to be reminded about my calling. And, and I chased all after money and power and authority, all those things. They became idols to me. It, it's what I sought to prove who I was, to find comfort and joy in those things. And, and candidly, I wasn't a very good husband, wasn't a very good father, because I was all about me. I wanted to be served. I didn't really want to serve other people. And then about 15 years ago, my wife really started struggling with her health, and she was diagnosed with lupus. And that suffering was a wake-up call for me, because I realized that what I thought was important, my career, was not the most important thing. And God had my attention at that point. And so I made changes to put God first and my family second. I'm a different man than I was 15 years ago because of that. And I can honestly say, if God hadn't allowed my wife to suffer from lupus, I would not be your pastor today. It changed me. It woke, woke me up. Several years ago, my, one of my nephews lived with me, and he was a, a really deep sleeper, but he's also hard of hearing. And so he had this alarm clock that was crazy loud. You could hear it through the house. But it also had these things that went under the mattress that kind of shook the mattress. That's what it took to get him up in the morning. And sometimes... That's what it takes to wake us up to what really matters. See, sometimes it takes suffering to remind us to look to the eternal and less about chasing the things of this world. Sometimes it's only when we get pushed to the limit, when we get pushed to that point of desperation, that we really see what really matters. Did you know that desperation can actually be a gift from God? Because it's in desperation that sometimes we find God. The most dangerous thing for you from an eternal perspective is for you to sleep all the way through this life and never realize what's most important. That's where suffering can come in. That's where suffering can make a difference. Here's the last alarm clock that any of us will ever hear one day. Bible tells us that when Jesus returns, there'll be the sounds of horns announcing his revival. It's an alarm clock we'll all hear. But the problem with that is if we haven't woken up, if we're not different by that point in time, it's too late. God wants us to wake up. He wants us to come out of our slumber and be reminded of what's most important. For Christians, he's reminding us, wake up, get back out there. Focus on eternal. And for non-Christians, he's reminding us that eternity is coming. Look at how the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 5, 14 through 17. He says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. In other words, the days are shorter than you think. Therefore, do not be foolish, 
but understand what the Lord's will is. It's what suffering does sometimes. Wake up. Wake up, sleeper. I I hope this sermon has given you a little perspective on why a good God allows suffering. But you know, even if it hasn't and you don't buy anything I've said, remember that God hasn't allowed us to suffer in ways that he's not also suffered. I I heard the story of a, a young preacher that was talking about a family that had lost an 18-year-old son, been killed in a car crash right before high school graduation. And and he'd gone to the funeral home to meet with the family and to pray with them. And he was sitting there with the mom, and she was angry. She was crying, and she was crawling out desperately to God. "Why? Why? Why would you allow this to happen? And then she looked at this young preacher, and she said, God doesn't have any idea what we're going through. God doesn't know how we're suffering. He's never lost a... And then her voice faded off because she knew our God did know. He gave his only son so that we could be forgiven and set free. Jesus suffered so that we could spend eternity with him. Jesus died so that we could be forgiven and we could be seen with the righteousness of God. And remember that God sees eternity. He knows that one day the suffering of this life will be a distant memory as we get to hang out with God and see Jesus face to face. And God knows that one day we're going to hear those horns, that final alarm clock, and he wants us to be ready. Wake up, sleeper. Let's pray.